And welcome to the Rock and Roll to Success. Today I have Gonzalo Paoli, the best English teacher in Latin America, <laughs> and also a story nerd, a Star Wars and Star Trek fan. And most recently, he's writing a comic book, which he's very excited about, and also working with Web3. So, Gonzalo, welcome to the show. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, I'm honored to be here. This is, uh, this is my first podcast. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, it's my pleasure, man. So how's your comic book coming up? How was your idea of developing it? And why did you get into Web3? Tell us about that. Well, there's like, there, there are several, several questions embedded in that, right? Uh, the, the comic is coming along a, a, a little bit slowly, but really nicely. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun just figuring out the little, like the different little pieces of the puzzle as I'm, as I'm building out the story. Uh, in the world of writing, they say that there are two types of writers, right? The, if you've heard this before, the plotters and there, you have the pantsers. A plotter is somebody who likes to figure out the story, uh, like the structure, how it's going to start, how it's going to end, what points are going to be along the way. And then you have the pantsers who like to just start with a prompt and go and just start writing, 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 and writing. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's really a third kind of writer that is that, that's kind of a mix of the two, and I think that's the LTS one. But I really lean heavily towards the plotter side of things. So what I'm doing right now is I'm not actually writing dialogue. I am figuring out the structure. Like right now I'm figuring out um, uh, like the, the first scene, like first of all, the, 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 the main story from beginning to end, what the first scene is going to look like, what's the main turning point going to be in that scene, and then I got to think about, well, well, why does that happen? Okay, well, something else needs to happen in the beginning. So I like to kind of put it together like a jigsaw, a jigsaw puzzle at the beginning and then start writing out, and in this case, not writing out the prose, but actually uh, figuring out the, like the panel layouts. Although I, I did kind of start a little bit with that just to kind of get, get, a, get an idea. But, but mainly what I'm doing is, is really figuring out plot points and characters and backstories and why this character does that and that character does that, does that other thing. Um, and, it's, and it's so much fun. I, I want to have it done, but just making it is, uh, the process itself of making it is, is a lot of fun. It's very satisfying. And it's the first time I'm writing a comic book, so it's exciting. That's awesome. And it's the first time that you write a comic book, but you have a lot of experience with writing in general. And you also hold the writer's room. You have built sort of a community around this. So would you like to talk about this as well? I hope to. I hope to like, continue building that community of people who enjoy writing as much as I do. I, I started the writer's room as... Uh, I don't know if I should say kind of an experiment, but like a little game or like a little thing that I've just felt like doing it just as an experiment to see if there was anybody else out there who would enjoy this kind of format as well, right? Um, to, to sit in a space and just write out a story together is something that you don't really see, right? It, it, it's like, it's a literal writer's room where we sit down and think, okay, well, that, let's think about this, right? Let's think about a story where uh, the character does that, this and this and that in a world where, um, I don't know, like the civilization has advanced enough to, so that they can uh, wrangle stars and they build artificial asteroids and they're doing this. And we start think of, thinking about characters in there. Why would they do this? And, and like in, in real time, I might have thought like, uh, like six months ago, I might have thought that would be not six months, it's been more than six months, like eight months ago, I might have thought that would be boring to other people, but it's had a um, really positive response. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking to, to keep doing that. It's, it's so much fun just to sit down for an hour. Usually it's about an hour to just plot out a story and, and figure, it, figure it out. Sometimes people have very um, different expectations, right? They'll think, okay, well, I have this idea about a boy and his pet dragon and I'm not sure where to take it like I don't know how to end it and then we just talk it out spitball ideas back and forth we workshop it and then other people come onto the stage and, and they raise their hand and say well what if it does this and what if the boy is, the, is from this place and what if the dragon does that and we end up at the end of the hour it's just one hour we end up having something really interesting uh, and we take notes right and we so we have something really interesting plotted out for the person who had the idea to kind of take and, and uh, and just go with it and make something even even more interesting and more fleshed out. And and the response has been really positive so far. So I'm very, very happy um, with that. I wanna keep I wanna keep doing that. And yeah, the community 
um, just to keep, you know, getting to know more people who are just as much of a story nerd <laughs> as I am, <laughs> because it's, um, it's, it's fun. It's what I've realized I like doing the most and, uh, and hopefully one day to make it the thing that pays the bills and, and just it's the, be, have it be the one thing that I, that I do, right, as, a, as, as work. I don't want to say as a job, but as work. And when do you think was the first time you noticed, as a boy maybe, that you were a true story nerd? Oh, no, that came much later. Uh, but then when I, when I realized, it's funny, because when I realized it, I looked back and, I, and, I, and it kind of dawned on me that it, it had always been there. I just didn't realize until I thought, until, until I, <laughs> I didn't realize it until I realized it. Right, but it is, it's always been there, and the the story that I that I always tell is that when I was, I think nine years old, I was really really into, well a lot of things, but the one of the most one of my biggest obsessions was Calvin and Hobbes, and I was not just into reading them and not just into buying the next book that came out as soon as it did. I actually wanted to make my own Calvin and Hobbes comic, which back then I didn't know would have been called fan fiction. So, uh, because I hadn't learned how to draw yet, um, I had this silly idea that, well, if I don't know how to draw, I guess I just, like, it's, since I can't draw, I guess I can't draw, you know what I mean? So, I, it was kind of like, I, it never occurred to me that I could just learn how to draw or just make drawings as, as, as you know, as they could come out. So, uh, what I ended up doing was trying to trace out a few panels from the books that I had to kind of spliced together new comic panels that I, that I would make up and had like and make this kind of like fan fiction comic book um and so so even from then like that, I think that was like the the start like you know the 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 start of um of this kind of journey like a, a little bit later on my parents would sometimes rent a camcorder for like family events and I would take it and just play around with it uh, there was a there was a time when I, when I was like I, I would experiment put the, put a, a, a blank tape in and like fly it around the yard pretending it was a spaceship or something, like crashing into a tree. And, and then I, I set it up in my room one day and, and I set up with like some a little dinky cars and those little metal cars and popsicle sticks on the ground. And I kind of recreated, I was also really a big, really big uh, Back to the Future nerd. Um, so I recreated mm. kind of the, 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 the scene where, where, you know, Marty goes back and, uh, and I tried to do the stop motion thing, but I didn't have a camera. I didn't have a stop motion camera or a film camera. So what I did was like I would press record and then stop and then move the car a little bit, record, stop, move it a little bit, record and stop. Um, and I used like uh, Play-Doh for, for the flames and I used like I just put like a, a blank sheet of paper in front of the camera for one frame for the flashes. So I, I was always kind of trying to play around with whatever I had on hand to, to make little stories. But it never it was never like this thing where I like to tell stories. It was just I like making this little video and I want to make this little comic and I want to do and when I was in high school I discovered the editing bay and oh my god it, it blew my mind it, the doors were blown wide open and I discovered editing and actual filmmaking for for what it is and I would it try to find any excuse whatsoever to make a little video a short film with my friends some it was usually some kind of action story with like fights and stuff because you know we were 15 and and we would try to shoehorn it into different courses, right? If we had some kind of presentation to do, I, I would always ask the teacher if I could, we could show a video, show like a little short film uh, to kind of uh, uh, present whatever it was. I don't remember. It was really shoehorned in. And they usually said, yes, that was a cool thing. And, and we had a lot of fun there. Then when I, at university, I decided I wanted to do, uh, make movies, you know? So like the closest thing uh, to film school that I had was, uh, audiovisual communication as a as a as a career, so I studied that. Uh, learned so much about lighting and framing and editing, more editing and stuff, the editing on a computer. Um, then uh, after that, I le went into Blender. I learned started learning 3D just because it was like making a movie, but on your computer. You didn't have to go rent cameras or get people to to, to, to hold the camera for you or anything, or get people to act in front of the camera. I could just do it all on the computer. So I I learned that for a few years and. It just kind of kept going and it kept changing, but I didn't realize until much later on that it, it, it all had kind of the same, um, the same thread, 
right? Because after after that, I also started working uh, doing children's parties where we would do. We had this kind of theatrical aspect to it, where we would dress up as like superheroes or villains for kids for their birthdays. You know, it's like. You know, like the Green Goblin, but he's here to ruin so and so's birthday. <laughs> he wants to steal the cake. <laughs> it was so much fun playing the villain. Again, storytelling, and I, and I did that on weekends for years. It's where I met my wife because she worked uh, there too. Uh, and then I did a little bit of children's theater with with one of my best friends, who I'm also met working there. And and so much of the, so much of it. And and, and then um, later on, and now we're talking about like roughly my 30s. We were. I was planning out and actually writing, uh, but writing for ourselves, right? We were going to make these uh, animated series uh, to be able to maybe pitch somewhere, like, you know, to, to, to shop around and see if we could get it produced. So I had always been searching, like, like going after the, the, the story element, right? Be, being some kind of a storyteller in whatever medium, but I, I wasn't conscious of it i was it was just going from one thing to the next to the next to the next but it was really kind of the same thing just different mediums and uh the the last thing that i landed on was uh okay so after so when i when we were trying to write these uh uh tv shows and these this pl these plays that we were making i started to, to study what story structure was actually all about like what makes a good movie i knew that you didn't need a big budget. It wasn't about the special effects. Uh, it was about a, telling a really great story. But I kept watching different movies, different, reading different books, and thinking, trying to answer the question, what actually makes a good story? Like, what is it about The Matrix that was so amazing versus The Matrix 2 <laughs> that wasn't so much? Right? <laughs> um, and, and I've been kind of on, on a road to, to you know, figuring that out and you know, finding structure, story structure. And, and then on the way, I accidentally got bitten by the drawing bug in my late 30s. I was 38 when I, when I decided I wanted to learn how to draw and, decided, and thought, hey, you know what? There are probably tutorials on this. I don't have to take a class. Not yet. I don't have to find it like at a school. There, are, there must be tutorials. So I started with like one little tutorial. And by the end of the 10, 15-minute tutorial, there was a, there was a little cartoon puppy on in my notebook that that I had drawn and I couldn't believe it so that like the dopamine rush from that was so big that I couldn't stop I just kept going and and I dove into drawing and and now uh, years later I, I I can draw and uh, and it, you know with the stories and 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 the drawing I thought comics so now I, I have a little web comic that I just started this year you know it's very fresh and new uh, and I'm also working on this comic, but the story, and I'll, I'll, I'll segue into the story for the comic because you asked me about that. I, I've actually been working on it for quite some time. I, I, I had the, the very first inkling of the, of the idea, the very first, first spark for the idea for that story from uh, this kind of experiment that we had, and I wish I'd looked at it before, before our interview. Um, I think it was Facebook uh, Meta, or, or it was some group of scientists, the developers, who released some version of very, very early AI into the world on the internet, and uh, their objective was for the AI to learn from the crowd, from the public. So anyone who's watching this podcast is going to know. They're going to be like, "Oh, it's the thing." Um, are they going to be able to look it up? So, but but the the point of the story was that they they wanted to see how much this AI could learn from the public. They say, "Hey, let's crowdsource it. Let's have people interact with it." and ask it questions and tell it things and see what it can learn. And very quickly, very, very quickly, um, they started treating it very, very poorly. They started insulting it, teaching it nasty things, asking it loot, th it, like, it, it, like the worst side of humanity immediately uh, showed itself and they had to shut it down. Uh, from, like, from what I remember that I briefly read about it when it, when it was in the news uh, or in some article online that I saw, it was like, no, we've got to shut it down. This is not working. <laughs> uh, so that idea kind of stuck with me. Plus all the, you know, the backlog of like Terminator movies and whatnot, you know, Matrix, Apocalypse and all that stuff, Robot Uprising, and the development of real life AI that's actually, that, that, that has been happening. And I read, read about this in like 2015, so it's been happening for a while. Uh, and uh, you can look up the, uh, oh, I'm going to blank on this, the alignment problem the alignment problem is something that they have not yet figured out as of the recording of this interview 
and it's a very, very big deal. It's a very, very big problem. So uh, we're not going to talk about that here, but you can, you can look it up. Um, so I started thinking, okay, well, imagine that little AI program had been aware, right? If it had been conscious and be like, Let, let's see what humanity's like. Hey, hi, everyone. Nice <laughs> to meet you. It's so nice to be here. I'm going to learn everything I can from you. And then it's like, you know... It, and it's and it's it, what it sees is basically humanity's worst, right? And and it's sparked that little idea of an innocent AI discovering the world um, in the worst possible way, right? So that's how Salvador came about. Um, I was I I started uh, I was kind of spitballing ideas back and forth with my friend, thinking about how can we make this this AI kind of really you know. Um, vulnerable and innocent. One of the first things that I thought, well, let's, let's make it a kid. It's, it can be a little boy who's a robot, you know, so that it's it's more visual. You know, it's like, uh, hi, you know, I, I, my name is so and so. Nice to meet you, and and everybody's just really mean to it. Uh, so we started developing it that way, and uh, I, w- I didn't at the time I didn't know what it was going to be, like what medium I was going to put it on. I didn't know if it was going to be a book or a, maybe a movie or a series. Um, and then, and then I then I came into a comic. Actually, I, I'm actually thinking manga, just because it's uh, there's no color in it and it's much more expressive. Uh, and I've been reading mangas lately, and, and they've been phenomenal. So I think I'm thinking it's going to be in more in a manga style. Um, and so the the story kind of kept growing from there, right? I, I don't know how much of the actual detail of the story you want to get into, but that's what sparked it, and that's what's kind of been on my mind for the past. I don't even know, like five, six years at least. It's been kind of there, kind of, kind of like knocking at the door. Hello, remember me? What about me? Um, so now I've I've actually taken the dive fully into like pre-production, like actual writing it, because there was this year, and here's the thing about Web three. There was this competition, this writing competition, um, uh, with so, uh, something called Solana Scribes. Solana is uh, one of the blockchains in Web3. It's not, not important for this conversation, but there was a writing competition to, pro- to, to, to submit your comic story proposal. You didn't have to submit the entire story, just your proposal, a pitch. And the winner would get $3,500 to develop it hire an artist, like write it and hire an artist and, and actually get out your first issue. And my eyes just opened up. I thought, this is it. This is, this is a chance. Let's do it. I knew that I wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it's not like it was a sure thing to win or anything because there were more than 200 people um, signed up for this. But it was enough of a push for me to say, you know what, I'm going to do it. I, I've been thinking about this story and like, and like building it little by little for years. And I'm like, how, like, how, I, I thought to myself, like, when, when am I going to do it? Like, when do I want to do it? Let's just do it. And so I dove in. And I'd, I'd already started my web comics. So I was like, all right, so let's just do both of them. And now I'm kind of screwing myself because I, I, there, I also have, you know, a job and two kids and, uh, and have to sleep sometime. But, that, you know, I'm, I'm getting there. But it's very exciting. It's very fulfilling. Um, and, and I'll say it's very exciting again, because just it, it merits it. It's just so much fun and so exciting to, to, to be actually doing that. And uh, I guess I'm a comic book creator now in the, in the making. <laughs> I love this. I love how you talk about since you were a little boy and how you were always very creative and you were always looking for a story to tell and how you eventually ended up going to film school and. I'd like to know a little bit more about how that experience shaped you and what did you do after? I know you talked a little bit about going to kids' parties to be the Green Goblin and meeting your wife. So it's yeah. pretty much a How I Met Your Mother story as well. So maybe yeah, yeah. you could talk a little bit about all of that. Um, well, the, the experience in, in university was, um, from a technical point of view, it was it was very fulfilling. I learned everything about uh, working a camera and lighting and like actual cinematography and framing and editing. Uh, a lot, a lot of that. It was, it was like from the technical side, it was very, very um, educational, right? I, I learned everything I need to know to make a movie basically, except <laughs> everything, except 
the actual writing because everything starts with a good script. And now I did have a few uh, creative writing classes in my five years there, uh, but in my opinion, not enough. And in my opinion, those classes, and I think like most creative writing courses that exist, that there are in the world, it's not, it, it's, it's too, it's too subjective, but, you know, uh, write your story and let's, and let's uh, give feedback, write, your, write it again, write it again, and let's see how we feel about it. There was no, you know, story 101 kind of class where, you know, in a story you need to have this and you need to have that, and you need to have that. There are books on this, but I only discovered that in my 30s, right? Uh, so I was, I was very satisfied with the, the technical aspect of what I learned. Um, but I didn't feel like I knew how to actually write a good story. Um, so that, that was the university. So then uh, years later, I started just reading, tried reading books, listening to podcasts. The podcast part of it was kind of the biggest uh, needle mover for me because I don't have a lot of time to read, but I do have a lot of time to walk the dog, do the dishes, even shower, like whatever it is. If I can listen to something while I'm doing it, driving, uh, mm -hmm. then then I can listen to, you know, the next episode of the podcast. And I found this podcast that I, I always talk about. People, <laughs> I always talk about it in the timeline, the Story Grid podcast, which is based on the book, The Story Grid. And, and, I, and I picked up other books like Story and uh, Save the Cat and all the, all the writing books that, that you know. But the one that, that was the biggest needle mover for me was the Story Grid podcast specifically because they actually talk about everything that you talk about in the book. And he gives them, like the, the, the author gives the host all this feedback week after week that I could listen to. Like, I could listen to three episodes in a row because I started listening to it uh, 2019, maybe 2020. And the podcast, I think, started in 2017 or 2016. So I had, I had a good backlog of episodes to just binge as much as I wanted. And I fe it felt like an entire, like a whole other degree that I was learning, like a you know, whole university degree, college degree that I was learning. Um, so that, uh, that was the biggest needle move for me. I don't remember the, the other part. I think I've drifted a little bit. What was the, the other part of your story? How I met my wife, how I met your mother. Um, the, the story. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. So in this, in this, um, small business, a family owned business that does, uh, or used to do, uh, birthday parties for kids, um, in the States in Canada in basically like most of North America, you don't have a lot of the type of birthday parties that you have in South America, at least mostly in, in Peru, right? Where uh, the family hires this, it's like a, it's like, almost like a theater company, if you look at it, but, but for kids, right? With, you, you hire them to do um, a bunch of uh, games with the kids and put on a little show, you dress up as whatever. Uh, we, we had this, this program where we integrated games with storytelling and uh, for the birthday party. So I actually got a lot better at writing and putting together stories during that time before I started actually actively learning because we would take something like the new Spider-Man movie and we'd have to, we would have to adapt everything that happens in the movie into a, a, a 45 minute program for kids that has to include games. It has to include like a, a, some kind of, I guess, a competition or a dance um, and, uh, and like an excuse to go sing happy birthday. So we, we learned, I learned to adapt whatever movie was hot at the moment. The, the kids were just crazy about it. They wanted to have, you know, Spider-Man or whoever it was, like, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, Avengers come to their birthday party. And we would have to tell this story, put on basically a little show. And by show, I mean like, 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 a, like theater, right? Like a play with interactive games and stuff. We, and, and it's like sitting down and writing that in retrospect was... was very fulfilling it was a lot of fun and I learned a ton about storytelling there because I had this like this movie that I had to kind of tell because the kids recognize it where the this this thing has to happen and this has to happen and this has to happen and then you know adapt it to like you know three-legged races and and the playing uh, freeze tag and <laughs> singing happy birthday right uh, so I, I got I, I learned a lot uh, in those years and and obviously, well, I, that's where I met my wife. We we both dressed up as some you know, some you know character or other in uh, in the year in our years there, and um, we had a lot of fun. And uh, well, I mean, the story of how you know how we 
it ended up you know going out and stuff that's maybe for another day but uh that's yeah that is where i met her that's where we where we met yeah that's so wholesome to think about all of these know, right? kids parties and <laughs> yeah. that must have been a lot of fun it and really while you were talking yeah sorry yeah. sorry well you say wholesome right but i i realized like when i started working for this uh business that's where uh, it, it's it's the job that kind of turned me on to to working with kids i had never worked with kids before and i don't know it it had this kind of um it kind of um i don't know what the word is what the word might be in english but it 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 tender tenderized isn't a word that's for meat. Uh, it 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 made it, it, it made now this it it made me have this like a different look. It made me look at at kids differently. You know, it made me see that you know, how cute and adorable they can be, and and it made me. Um, I guess it softened me up, you know, to to working with kids a little bit. And after that, I had a lot of ex of opportunities to work with kids later on in a school, and you know, teaching English. Uh, and a whole other whole list of other things. So they kind of opened the doors for that too. And and the the story that I wrote I haven't talked about yet. The book that we have, um, it just needs illustrations. Um, is for kids. So it kind of shaped my my vision and my angle. Like who who I kind of want to uh, teach most is uh, that experience. There. Sorry, I I cut you off before. Go ahead. You were saying something. No, don't don't worry about that. <laughs> I cut you off, actually. So uh, I was going to ask you about how all of this, the story grid and all, everything that you learned, do you apply this on the writer's room? And also another question would be about, since you are also a movie geek, not only a story geek, and you know everything about audiovisual and lighting and camera angles and everything, um, how do you see someone like a Steven Spielberg or a George Lucas? Do you think their role as a director, the most important part is about the story or the technical aspects that they bring as well? Uh, it, well, the technical aspect and the vision and, and all those things that they bring to life, they, they form, like, they become part of the experience, right? The experience that you have watching a movie so it's it's very very important but i do think uh, e even though the director kind of orchestrates the whole thing and thinks about music if this is fitting for that scene and, and thinks about art and you know if that look for that dress is good is fitting for that character and kind of puts it all together um it's it they they give the director like the the audience i think like we as the audience give the director all of the responsibility like if the movie was bad it's all the director's fault if the movie was great it's all because the director's awesome but then you have uh, you know one movie that that, that a direct that, that that does really really well directed by so and so uh you say well that's a great director so now every movie that i watch the, the next the next every movie that this director has put out i'm going to watch because they make great movies but then you watch the next movie by the same director and it's not as good right it's not it's not quite as good so It's not just the directing. The directing, really, what, it, what, what a director really does is bring everything together, right? Make sure that, you know, the script makes sense. Does this story point make sense to come after this other story point? Is this foreshadowed in the beginning? No, then you need to put it there because we, we got to justify this, this thing happening at this point. You know, they can kind of fix those little things, but they also, they're also looking at this whole other slew of things like does the music fit is the art right does the, does the cinematography look okay i think the director the works most closely with the cinematographer but but the really director is like is kind of sitting there orchestrating the whole thing is kind of you know bringing it all together i think that the greatest movie it it, de it depends on all that on all those things but it, the first step before anything if you're before and you call before you call hollywood calls anyone Before you hire, like, the, the first cameraman, before you think about hiring an artist, before you do any of those things, it all starts with the script. People say screenplay writing, right? I like to write a screenplay. I like to write a novel. I'd like to write a this, write a that. Right? No, whether it's a screenplay, novel, comic book, uh, stage play, 
it's really all storytelling. Now, the director's a storyteller too, because they're taking this story and they're, they're thinking, okay, well, this story is about this. Okay, let's, let's make the sound editing like this so that it, it, it feels... I don't know if you saw 127 or 129 days. The one, with, uh, the one about the guy who got his arm stuck under a rock for, for 120-something days. There, there is a harrowing scene at the very end when, when he does the unthinkable to survive. I don't want to... I mean, it's been out a few years. I don't think spoilers yeah, I think are think everyone knows what happens. But Dude, yeah. that, that, that scene where he, he like has to saw through his arm, that wasn't, that wasn't an experience because of, the, because of a good script. That was an experience because of the sound editing, the sound design, the directing... All that stuff, like the cameras, just like I, I especially remember the sound, the, the way that they, just, they they made it so that you felt the 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 thing cutting through the nerves in the arm, and I I remember, I remember thinking, oh god, it's painful. I was, I mean, I wasn't in any pain, but it was, it felt painful. So it was an experience, you know. That was a great part of that movie, and uh, and, and so it's it's they're all part of it's 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 like an orchestra, right? They're all important. You, you can have a great conductor, but if the tuba player messes up, you're going to notice. And it's not going to be as good. Like, the experience isn't going to be as good. You can still... I mean, the Ninth Symphony can still be great, but if the tuba player sucks, <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, then it's not going to be as good. So, it, so they do all contribute towards the experience. And, uh, and I think in comic books, it's easier not to mess up because it's the writer and artist. Yeah, okay, letterer, colorist, but, you know, writer and artist is basically it, right? Nice. I like you're not you're not going to enjoy a, a manga or a comic book as much if it's like all stick figures, unless it's unless that's the the artistic proposal. But if, if it's poorly drawn, that's one thing. But if it's poorly drawn, even if it's a great story, it's 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 going to take away from the experience. You can have a great story, but the art is not so good. You know, like um, One Punch Man, like the first, like it's infamous for for having really bad art at the beginning, but it was but the story was so so good that people picked it up anyway. And and then they actually redid the art afterwards, but but it goes to show, you know, it's it's all part of the experience. That's what I'm trying to say. If you just keep letting me ramble, I'm just going to keep rambling. So I'll stop. <laughs> for no, now. you you go ahead, man. I'm I'm letting you ramble because that's what we want. We want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Thanks. Talking about comic books and manga, how do you see the experience? differing between them, but also especially between them and the other concoctions that they make, like anime or maybe a movie that's inspired in a comic book. How do you see that? Uh, it's, the same, it's the same story, right? But it's a different experience. It's not the same to, 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 to be reading either even a novel or a comic book, or a comic book and a manga, even you know, as, as similar as they are. It, it, the experience is slightly different. Uh, mangas tend to be more intense, you know, more emotionally driven. Um, and then when, when you see, when, when you transition from, um, let's say, a manga to an anime, the, the animation studio plays a big role, right? The quality of the animation, the quality of the drawings as they translate from the page to the screen is a big part of it, even though you're telling the same story. So it's, 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 it goes to the same point that I made before. When you're making, when you're writing a, a a comic book or a manga, there's a team of people who are working together to make an experience, right? To to, to kind of create an experience for whoever's going to ex, experience. I say experience, uh, experience that story because it can be a reader or a viewer or a listener, depending on what you're doing. You, there, radio dramas aren't as much of a thing anymore, but it's all a story that you're experiencing. So then, when that gets adapted into an anime. The story's there and it's great, but now you've got to find an art director. Now you've got to find great animators. You've got to find more artists who, who can actually, you know, you've got to find in-betweeners, not just the artists who make the panels, because animation is 24 frames every second, or 30 frames, or however, well, it can be less for, for anime, right? But it's a whole different skill set that, uh, that you've got to find people for. So it's, it's, a, it's an undertaking, and you, it can be done right, or it can be done wrong. And, uh, and that depends on the, the quality of people that you can get to, to do that new that new thing, that new project. It's a new, it's a new project with the same story. And do you think that in the world of web three nowadays, it's easier to find that kind of people? I think there's a lot of community in web three. And 
once if if you manage to create a really tight knit community, people in that community are very very enthusiastic, and they can be very loud about the support that they give to any project that they're that they're that they're, they're supporting. So it's a, it's a great place to get to know other people, to get to know people who, in my case, who like to read comics, people who like to make comics, people who like to not just make, but like branch that off into people who like to write comics, people like to draw for comics. And so it's, it's, it's a great place for people to come together. And it's a great, and it's not even a place, right? I'm, I'm still in the same house, I'm sitting in the same chair. But it, it, like on the internet, it's, it's, a, it's a great, medium or I, let's just say place it's a great place to 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 distribute your work your 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 whatever it is it can be a project it can be a business there are i I'm, i've seen several like clothing brands who started as a pfp project uh on uh on in web3 or who actually are a pfp project with nfts but you get special discounts on the t-shirts that you buy so they're, they're really the base for a business and the people who are in that project who support that project buy the clothes or or take the class or um or, or download the music or read the comics in my case like i i am i've joined i joined the d reader community a few months ago and i think it was in december now and I could not be more bullish, as the kids say, uh, on, on that project because they are very dedicated and um, committed to improving or fixing or improving the, 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 the web, uh, no, sorry, the, um, the comics industry. You know, make it so that comic creators can actually make a living off of what they do and readers or collectors of comics can actually collect like the the collecting experience can be better for them too because it's not the same as uh buying a comic on kindle right because you can have you can buy it on kindle you can have it on your tablet but can you lend it to someone can you can you trade it for another comic like you would a physical one can you can you sell it can you, you can't do any of those things nfts allow that to happen it's digital yes it's not quite the same as a physical book but now I can say that I have this comic. It's mine. I can lend it to someone. I can send it to someone who lives halfway around the world, who's a friend and I trust for them to give it back, and, and they can send it back. I can say, I don't want this anymore. I, know I kind of finished. I'm done with it. And I can sell it in a marketplace. I can have two copies of one comic book and, have, and, and find someone who has this comic book that I don't have, and I can trade one of mine for, for one of theirs, and then I can have it in my wallet and, and, and open it and read it. It's much closer to a, to a physical experience than, say, something on Kindle. So uh, for those reasons, I've, I've really gotten into that space because I think it's, it's the right way to go. It's the right way to do it. And people are more willing to support that project, which means they're more willing to, to pay slightly higher uh, uh, prices for a new comic that comes out. Versus like the three dollar Marvel comic, of course they they have the channel to distribute it to ten million people, but an indie comic, you gotta, I mean, you better be a, a, a Kickstarter master if you want to be able to eat with that, right? But in Web three, there are more people willing to get behind the project, support it, and and mint even sometimes multiple copies because you have like you know different variants of of a, of a cover, right? Where out of a thousand copies that you're minting, only a hundred of them are going to be this variant cover, and only like uh, fifty of them are going to be this variant cover. So it becomes a game for them. So uh, that, there are a lot of ways for uh, for creators to to really um, connect with their communities, especially through Discord. I think Discord is Discord and Twitter are where or X, sorry, are where um, Web three lives most of what, from what I've seen so far in my journey and. It, you can be there and chat with the writer of the comic that you're reading and get them to sign it, sign it digitally. It, it's wild. So I'm, I'm, that's why I'm so, so enthusiastic about doing it in Web3, specifically on DReader, because I've, I've, you know, I, I found them back in December. They've been really welcoming. They're really great. And uh, I've just been minting everything they put out because it's, it's so awesome what they're doing. And that's why mine's going to be on there, too, when it's done. And do you think that, how do you think that this will shape the world going forward? Because it's still in a very incipient phase. It's still baby stepping its way. Yeah. 
how do you see this in five, ten years from there's, now? There's a running joke in Web3 where everybody always says, we're early, right? I mean, crypto has been around since 2009. That's 15 years. But people still say we're early, and it's a running joke because, you know, you, you, you kind of get, you, once you've been there for two, three years, it's like, what, are we still early? What, what is, but we kind of are. Right? It's a running joke, but it's kind of true because, because it's still hard to get in. You still have to learn about wallets and where you, where you, how you open one, what a wallet is. Um, can I, hey, this, this person on the internet said that they can uh, safeguard my, my, my tokens um, if, I, if, if I you know, log in with my passcode, with, with my secret seed phrase. Um, oops, I don't have any more money. All my, all my things are gone. Why? There are, there's a lot that you have, there, there, it's a very big, um, uh, what's the word? There's, there's a very, very big bar barrier to entry when you first start out uh, in crypto. So for that reason, it's still early and it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's, you still, it still requires a great deal of effort from the person, from the user's point of view. So I, I wanted to learn more about crypto and Web3 and NFTs and I, and I wanted to, to get into it. So I took the time to figure out what it was about, what is an, what actually is an NFT, what, what, like literally, physically, what is an NFT, what is it, and to learn what it means and why people are paying thousands of dollars for a JPEG, like why? That's the biggest thing, right? That you have to get over when you first get in, and you slowly start to discover what it, what it's really about. Uh, so it's not, it, 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 it is far from being widely um, uh, adopted. So that's why people still say we're early because we are. Because we are. I mean, your grandma isn't on, isn't on, uh, you know, Solana on the Solana blockchain. She uses WhatsApp though, right? Or Telegram. She uses some kind of SMS t uh, messaging app. So that's widely accepted, but not crypto. Like your grandma doesn't have. Your grandma probably doesn't have Bitcoin. She probably doesn't have, you know, like a, a phantom wallet. So we're still a, a, a ways away. Once your, you know, your mom and your and your and your and your grandma know how to use it. That's when you know it's been you know widely adopt. There's been wide adoption, which is kind of what everybody's working for. Uh, but there there are a lot. There's a lot. There's there's quite a few, a lot of work to be done there still. I mean, I am no expert by the way on any any of this crypto stuff because I've been here. I started learning in November, and it's as of this recording, it's May, right? The first days of May. So it's been seven. What? Uh, let's do the math. It's January five. Is it seven months? Yeah, seven months. Uh, since since no six months I'm sorry six months six months yeah, yeah exclusive inclusive so six months uh, and I and I still feel like a like a crypto baby like a Web three baby I wouldn't I don't want I shouldn't say crypto because crypto is more about just like the the actual coins the actual currency right uh, but really it's more about just everything blockchain related and like true ownership true digital ownership and all that stuff that they talk about so I uh, I like to think of it more as Web three right. Um, web 1.0, as you know, probably know, it's, it was more about like a read only kind of internet, right? It was only read. You can only read what was on the web pages. You couldn't interact with it. And then web two came around where you could actually, you know, log in, put in your name, leave messages. You could, you could write on that. It was like a read and write. So web two was more about write and web three, um, the buzzword is own, right? Uh, you can own things online. It's not your Kindle book. You don't own your Kindle book, okay? If, if Amazon decides to shut down tomorrow, it's done. Like, like if, like, let's say, okay, sure, you can still have the, the app on your phone and you can still have it there. But if you get a new phone or for something happens, that file is gone and that book is no longer yours. You have your Netflix account. You, you cancel your Netflix account tomorrow. You've been, you may have been paying for Netflix for 10 years, but that movie is no longer yours. You don't, have, you don't have access to that movie anymore. With Web3, that's different. It changes. You buy a comic book on, on Solana, on D-Reader, that's yours forever. Right? As, as long as you maintain, you, you take good care of your wallet and you don't give away your seed phrase, you know, the little things that one has to learn. Once, if, you, if you can take care of your wallet, that comic is yours forever to do whatever you want with it. You can leave it collecting digital dust. You can give it away. You can sell it. It's yours. You know, that's, that's kind of the big deal uh, about Web3. Yeah, when you talk about this, it kind of reminds me of the internet on in the 90s and 
also the banking system yeah. at that time, how it was different from what it is right now. And it really seems like it's early and it kind of gets me thinking about how many things will change. Like for instance, someday probably you'll have some kind of bank, like a bank type of entity that can, can hold your, your, I wouldn't say objects, like your files and your, everything that you want They call them assets. To. And your the assets. thing is, you don't need a bank, right? You don't, you don't really need a bank, but inevitably there are going to be services that come up. There are, there are, there are already some of them, right? Services that can uh, take your assets into custody, like kind of like take care of them for you. It's kind of like when you go with your $100 to the bank and you deposit it and you're like, here, take care of this for me. And then you just have your bank account, right? Um, I guess that that kind of thing is going to pop up because not everyone in the world is going to want to, uh, you know, write down on a physical piece of paper a list of twelve words and and put it like in a drawer and like that's my life savings. I can't lose that. Oh my god, the anxiety, right? Uh, not everyone's going to be comfortable with that. Like, uh, you know, so there are going to be probably services popping up who that that can that can take care of that for you, but. The, th the 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 idea here is to not have banks anymore not cuz like if like right now if you want to send $100 to somebody halfway around the world what do you have to do you have $100 there's no web3 what do you have to do to send $100 to somebody in taiwan it's complicated right i mean there's western union sure and that's kind of the easiest way uh, but you have like, if you like you know if your swift account your swift numbers and it, it it's kind of a Thing, right it's a thing they have to it, and, and you have to like the bank has to kind of let you have it and if and there were protest there was a, a, a big protest in Canada I think it was last year um, uh, where they blocked some roads right there was this big the big thing that happened in Canada last year and the government decided to freeze their bank accounts because they were being unruly nobody can freeze your Bitcoin ever because it's yours no one can touch it nobody if they don't have your seat phrase they can't touch it. I mean, they'd have to break into your house, like uh, tie you down, open your drawer, take out the notebook and copy the phrase down to take your money. They can't, you, nobody can freeze your account. Nobody can, like if you have like a, let's say you're paying off debt, right? You're paying off your credit, credit card debt. If you have money in the bank, let's say you're not doing so hot, right? You have money in the bank and you have like, you're down to like your last hundred dollars, right? But today's, like this month's minimum payment for that credit card is $100, but you haven't done the groceries yet. And you're like, I'm going to have to be, you know, I'm going to have to be a little bad this month because I need to get, I need to get that food first, right? Except you go to the ATM and the money's gone because the bank already charged, the, the bank already um, took what's theirs. They can't do that with Bitcoin or with, or with any uh, cryptocurrencies. They can't, you can't do that. You have to take it out of your bank and pay it. Uh, there are going to be probably some ways to fix the uh, auto payment. Um, what is it? Auto, uh, automatic payment because people like automatic payments. So there's going to be a way around that. But the point, like the main point here is, I guess, like if, in, if you could sum it up in one word, it's sovereignty. It's, it's you are the owner of your value. Uh, I don't even want to say money because it can be your comic books or it can be your anything. Your contracts, your your whatever you want to put on that blockchain, it's yours, and it's as safe as you can keep a, a little piece of paper with a list of twelve words. If you can put it in your pocket and hide it from other people, you can you know stuff it in like in like the third book on your shelf you know, on page fifty six, and nobody knows it's there but you. No one's gonna find it ever. It's yours, and no nobody can touch it. They'd have to literally, you know, come into your house and. And, uh, and, and pin you down and, and search your home and find the list. And it, it, it's, it's, um, there's no way for anyone to freeze your accounts or freeze your funds or, or like charge you money without your, your consent. So that's... Uh, what happens if you different. lose your list? That's the, that's the downside of it. That, that's why it's, it's still a problem to be... That's one of the big problems to be solved because what does happen if you lose that little list of 12 words? Well, you're screwed. There's no way to get it back. Because the, the cryptography involved in blockchain is so advanced and so uh, secure that without that pass key, there's no getting your money back. There must be a significant amount of Bitcoin lost forever just because people lost their lists.
people lost their, their freight. I mean, I have mine in more than one place. I don't have a lot in there either. But it, I mean, I'm a little paranoid. So I have, a, I have it in more than one place and, and no one but me knows where, uh, where they are. Uh, so it's, I mean, it, it's up to the user. That's, that's, the, that's the thing about sovereignty, right? You're free to do whatever you want, but you're also responsible for what you do. So if I lose my list, no bank is going to come and say, oh, let's recover your password. No, sorry, man. It's yours. Only you can touch it. Great. Only you can also lose it. You can also, sorry. What, also, you, it's also true that only you can lose it and only you can get it back. If you can't get it back, oh, well, it's gone. But I had my entire life savings. Oh, yeah, but you should have taken care. You know, so it, it's still a work in progress. That's why people say we're early. That's why it's a running joke because we've been saying we're early for, they've been saying we're early for, forever. And it's still true because there are still a lot of things that need to be solved, like that issue, right? Because no one is, a, is paranoid. Not everyone is paranoid like me or, or as like OCD about keeping the thing in the same place and, and making sure it's not lost. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done still. And uh, that's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting to be, to be part of that and to kind of see it develop as it, as it goes, as time goes on. Yeah, I, I also feel a bit of paranoia coming from the people in the crypto space concerning, like you said, the case in Canada of the government freezing people's accounts. Yeah. And also, if you think about it, in the case of what they did to the Russians as well, freezing their assets in a bunch of countries, and how will people who invest their money in other countries as well, like if the country that they are a citizen of, something happens, a war or whatever happens, like what happens to your stuff then? Like, yeah. I think in this day and age, it is a bit of paranoia, but at the same time, things are happening that are quite weird that 20 years ago, no one would think would be possible. Yeah, you know, when, when you were a little kid, if you did something wrong, or if you were uh, immature about something, you did, you did something bad, uh, your parents would take away your, your toys, right? Your, your, or they would take away your video game. They, they would ground you without being able to do this or that. <clears throat> um, people being unruly, protesting, even if they do things that they shouldn't, um, to, take, to freeze their accounts is like kind of like a little bit like treating them like, not a little bit, it's Too like much. treating them like children, right? And sovereignty is about forcing governments to treat us like adults, the adults that we are. Now, if I go and break private property, damage private property, or go and hurt someone, or go and kill someone, of course, they have to, there have to be consequences. Someone has to be arrested. But it's not like I speak out against whatever issue, and then the government says, oh, no, no, you can't do that. So then they freeze your accounts. They, there's nothing stopping them from, from doing that one day. Like today, it's, or yesteryear, <laughs> like last year, it was, it was being part of a protest. Next year, it could be just like making a, like writing a tweet saying, this should be that. Whatever it is, pick your poison. It doesn't matter. If government says, Big Brother says, you shouldn't be saying that, free, they can just freeze your account. Uh, Bitcoin is a way of saying, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, and Not with me. AI, <laughs> with AI being so widespread, it's ever easier for them to do that if they want to. Well, yeah. So that's why, yeah, that's why we're, we're we are. You know, it's, it's like I'm an activist or something. It's that's why Web three wants to 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 push this forward. You know, to to to, to make this um, something that is accessible for everyone, for everyone to have. You know, an an account. What is it they call the non-zero Bitcoin account? Like, it doesn't matter that if you have like. A ten thousand dollars, or a thousand dollars, or a hundred dollars—it doesn't matter. As long as it's not zero, that you know, to like dip your toe into into world into the world of Web three and realize what it is to really own something. Like, like, I, like my Solana wallet. I like I can send I can send money anywhere in the world in seconds without asking for anyone's permission. I can send you ten dollars. Like that, you give me your wallet address, doo, 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 and I send it, and I put it in there. It's there, and like ten seconds later, it's in yours. And I didn't have to go through a bank to do that. Now you have the money. It's like coming to my door and say, "You got ten bucks? Yeah, sure. Here, here you go." It's that easy and fast. Once you know, once you have your wallet, once you have, you know how to use it. Once you have that, oh man, it's it's like it's like your friend knocking on your door and saying, "You got ten bucks? I can borrow." It's like, yeah, sure. Give it, give it to him. 
And then they come back later and they, they, they give you back your money. It's that easy. That's, what, that, that's what's so mind-blowing about blockchain. That why the people who are in it are this enthusiastic about it. And I've kind of become enthusiastic about it too because it's so cool what you can do there. It is. It is so much that can still be imagined and done. And... But I think one thing as well that governments hate blockchain is that it's how will they charge your taxes? That's something that they're going to have to figure out. Sorry. They're going to have to figure out a way. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's the same as, you know, you scam a, 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 some kind of agency or some kind of an institution for millions of dollars. Well, you can't freeze their accounts, but you can find them and arrest them, obviously. So, you know, find other ways to, 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 to have consequences in society for the things that people do that they shouldn't be doing, obviously. But freezing my account is not going to be one of them. Because it's my money. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so we've, we've talked a little bit about this before, but what's your flavor of weird? Oh, yes, my flavor of weird. Um, I, I always like to say, you know, it's, you, you said in your, in, your, in your question, you know, something that you're into that nobody else, no one else understands, right? But here's the thing about finding a community. It depends on what you define as no one else, right? Because here like on X and in Discord and Web3 and whatever niche we're in, um, there are lots of other people who like the things that I like. So they're not weird here. It's like that Blind Melon video. Uh, you know, you know the, the song No Rain by Blind Melon? The video is uh, of a little girl in a bee suit. Here, for those, uh, I'm aging myself because this is from the 90s. But there, it's, the, the song starts out, and this is a little girl who's in a little bee costume. And uh, she goes around to different places. Like, I'll try to give like, the 10 second version of it. She goes around to different places. She goes to like, uh, her, her house, she goes to a classroom, she goes to this place and that place, she goes to like, the store, the bookstore. And everywhere she looks out of place. She's, she's weird. And everybody looks at her and it's like, she's looking for her friends and she's looking for like, other bees or whatever. But no, she's different from everyone. She doesn't fit in anywhere. And at the end of the song, she finds, uh, I believe it's a, it's a theater group, right? It's like this theater class where everyone is dressed up as little bees and she sees them and she jumps for joy and she goes and runs and joins them and they do like their, their, their dances their weird dances together and they they put on their show she found her crowd so i think my flavor of weird as in like non-normies it's gonna be it's gonna have to be web3 uh definitely storytelling because people don't just talk about storytelling they, they, they did you watch the game did you see this movie yeah great movie yeah and all oh, this one was not so good no one is obsessed like not no one i shouldn't say no one not as many people as you would think outside of this space is obsessed with writing good stories, right? Um, uh, science fiction, um, mangas, like reading comic books and reading mangas, that, all that stuff is the, the stuff that brings me joy that not a lot of other people have. That's, that's what I consider to be, you know, weird, but I love it. Yeah, I think one of the big things about the internet is that you can find your beehive and all of the little yeah. bees can come together <laughs> right. wherever they are. Right. Yeah, that's what's and, great about it, yeah. And do you think it's easier for you to find your beehive in Canada or in Peru? And what's the difference between... That is a good those... question. And I, I think I would have to say... Probably Canada, I think, maybe, but but I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of wonderful geeks here in Peru that you know who share the love for for comics. But I don't know. Like I grew up speaking English, so I I want my comics in English, and I can't find them easily here. Like it, it took me a year to complete my Pluto collection because I wanted it. I wanted the English translation. Pluto is the, this manga that I, that I read um, at the very beginning when I started reading mangas. And it, it took me that long because I couldn't find it in any bookstores here. I think, and, and there aren't as many cons here either. Like if, if, I, if I were to move to the States or to Canada, there are cons for almost anything uh, and all over the place for, for a lot of different things. So yeah, maybe it would be easier to find my little beehive um, if I were living in Canada, because it's a lot easier to find, you know, the, the, 
manga convention or, or, or this or that. And there are some here, but I think it would be a little bit easier over there, I guess, if, if, uh, if, I, if I had to give an answer. Instead of Canada or the US? Oh, well, I mean, the main reason we moved back here was bas it was basically our family. Because when we, when we went to Canada, we kind of went uh, on our own almost. We, we went, it was like the four of us. Uh, and then another one of our fa like another family, uh, my aunt and uncle and their kids went as well. And the original idea was for us to all kind of migrate over there, but it kind of fell through, and and it ended up being like of my grandparents' four kids, uh, two of them, my mom and her sister, stayed. We we stayed in Canada, and the other two stayed here, and my grandparents ended up staying here too. And like my the entire almost the entire like, no not, not entire, half of my dad's side ended up splitting up too. So it was, it was complicated. And like after 10 years, my parents said, you know what, it's, it's, uh, we miss home and we'd like to go back. And my dad got a job offer. It's this whole thing, it's this whole story. So, uh, I, I don't remember where I was going with this anymore. <laughs> I blanked, but um, the, the perk of, coming, of being here is basically reuniting with family. It was, really, it, was, it, was good. it was being with family here. It's not so much about finding, uh, you know, a, a, a beehive or, or or getting more work or any of that stuff. It was just basic, basically to be with family. And the food's great. And the food is definitely <laughs> exactly, better as well. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because what I've seen of Canadian food, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't look very tasty. It's, it's, it's okay. Some, I mean, some of it is all right, but um, it's, it doesn't compare to like Peruvian cuisine or Brazilian cuisine. It's not the same. Oh, yeah. And, and I've seen that Lima is one of the food capitals of the world nowadays with a bunch of star yeah. restaurants. Yeah. If we move back to Canada, the food would definitely be one of the things that I miss the most, that I would, that I would miss the most, the food. Yeah, I think your sons wouldn't like it as well. <laughs> well, I don't know. My, my oldest is actually really into uh, Japanese food right now. He's really into like eating Mackey's and... And uh, I, I tried to get him to try sushi, but he's like, no, no, that's raw fish. Forget that. Which is funny because ceviche mm -hmm. is raw fish too, but it's cooked with the, with the lemon juice. It's different. It's, 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 it's like it's cooking on your plate as, as you eat it. So it's different. He's like, no, I don't want to try that. It's raw fish. But he's still 10. He's, he's got time. He got into this whole Japanese culture kick because of mangas. It was my, it's my fault. <laughs> I had the mangas. He was like, hey, what's that? Can I read it? Yeah. And he just fell in love with it. So now they're like One Piece big fans and they love going to like sushi bars, maki bars. And uh, well, I should say they, the, he does, they, the oldest one does. Yeah, like father, like son. Yeah. So maybe, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can find plenty of uh, quality Japanese restaurants in Canada if we, if we go back there. I think, I think they'll be okay. And there's lots of, you know, there are lots of Peruvian restaurants all over the world too. I mean, the food is famous enough. So we'd probably be able to find it. Uh, all right. Plus, plus, you know, we know how to make it. So we we we, t we would obviously cook Peruvian home cooked meals uh, a good deal of the time, so they wouldn't have to miss it that hard. And do you have a special family recipe for ceviche? No, no. Like my my wife made ceviche once, maybe twice. I don't know. There's there's no like special family recipe. It's really just like the kind of it's it's up to the it it all depends on the kind of fish that you choose there's there's a type of fish that's better um and and like the the mix with like the lemon juice and uh and all the other little things right they got like the right kind of corn it's got to be you know, your sweet potatoes got to be baked just right but it, it's not that complicated it's just that it's it was born here it's it's not really that at least i don't think it's that complicated i'm not like a, a you know a great cook by any stretch of the imagination but the the concept behind making good ceviche is not that hard it's just that it, maybe it's harder to find good ingredients let's say in the middle of the continent where there's no ocean versus here in lima where like the, like the ocean is 20 minutes away and if you go to the market there's fish fresh fish there every single day it's different yeah i've thought of doing ceviche but the leche de tigre was too hard and I was like, I'm not so going to good. do this. Yeah, so it is. It is. I love, I love ceviche. I love Peruvian food, but ceviche is the best. Yeah, you're making oh, me hungry. What I've tried at least. Is... <laughs> now I want some leche de tigre. Tiger's milk, right? It was, it was born from like the ceviche leftovers and people say, no, no, wait, don't throw that away. 
It, it was started with people saying, don't throw that away. Here, give it to me. And they put it into a little, a little cup and drink it. And it became its own dish. People, like, restaurants started putting more fish into it. Some restaurants even, like, take the, the leftover parts of the, some of the fish that's left over and liquefy it and put it in and make this, like, this really thick, consistent drink that is hot as hell. <laughs> but it's so good. With with all the lemon juice and everything, it's 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 its own. It's almost its own dish. It's really really quite quite good. Um, that yeah. I'm saying um for for just for. A, a I'm getting filling. hungry now. I know, right? It's, it's it, I think I'm gonna go. I'm gonna have to go raid the fridge. I don't have any ceviche in there, but I'll, I'll have to see, see what I can find. It's all your fault, Gabe. And, and talking about your boys and being an awesome storyteller, I think they must be very. Um, how do you say it? It's a, it's kind of a privilege to have a dad that can tell awesome stories. And do you like to tell them stories as well? We we have always encouraged reading in our house uh, ever since they were babies. Uh, like you know, like the bedtime story is an integral part of the nighttime routine, bedtime routine. And I think that has had more than one positive outcome on, uh, with them, in them. Uh, not, not necessarily that they're going to become authors or anything one day, but just, you know, like my oldest, they both really like to read. My oldest son read the entire Harry Potter uh, series in uh, two weeks, I think. It was, it was ridiculous how fast he read it. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I'd see him reading like part two, and then suddenly a couple of days later, I'm, I see him reading the, like he's halfway through part three. I'm like, "You finished part two yesterday?" He's like, "Yeah." <laughs> wow. Okay. So, uh, and sometimes they like I'll catch them like doing the little comics uh, like on paper. But I think it's also like natural for a lot of kids to 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 ex- want to express themselves with that. They don't. I think you don't. I don't think you necessarily have to have a comic book writer dad. To, to be seven years old and like be like writing a, you know, a, little, a little comic story about robots fighting and blowing up and stuff. I think that, uh, I, but, but I like to think that it's, it's encouraging it more because, it, uh, because they see it in me, right? They've seen me teach drawing classes for years and they, uh, they, they you know, and I, I don't push it on them. They, did, they just, you know, they pick up a piece of paper and a pencil and sometimes draw a little thing. And um, it's good for them. It's good to, for them to, to express themselves. It doesn't mean they have to become an artist as, uh, when they grow up. It's just a good, healthy thing to do when they're kids. Oh, definitely. And especially the love of reading, I think it's a very important thing that will help them down the line when yeah. at school or at yeah. college to learn anything. You just really to need to, yeah. to, to begin loving to read at a, a young age. And, and I'm happy to know that your Otis yeah. likes Harry Potter. I see myself in him as well because, of course, at that time when I started reading Harry Potter, they didn't have all of the books, but I, you had to wait I speed for the next read one. all of the books that were available at the time as well. Yeah, yeah. When, and it's funny because I, I haven't... After I, um, after I started college, I stopped reading as much as I used to when I was younger. So... I didn't even read, I haven't read the Harry Potter books. I watched all the movies. I, got, I watched them in the theater. I saw them in the theater um, as they came out, but I never actually read the books. Um, and that's something that I have to fix. Not, not reading Harry Potter, but just reading more in general. I used to read, I used to be a massive bookworm when I was a teenager and a kid. Um, and, uh, and now it's just a matter of you know, trying to find more time to, to read more because it's, it's, it's a fun time. It's a good time. It's just you and your book and the world that you're, you know, that you're diving into. So I think it's, uh, it's something that I'd like to do more now, like for myself, you know, reading more. Yeah, me too. And I think I should read more fiction actually, because I pretty much only read nonfiction. Oh, I love books. fiction. I love reading fiction. It's so good. Non-fiction What's your favorite? What- Sorry, nonfiction is when I want to learn something, right? I'll read a ton of nonfiction when I want to learn something. I want to figure something out. Um, but fiction is, is just so, it's so enriching. It's so exciting. It's so, it, 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 you, just, you dive into this world and you can't come out. It, it, it's, it's, it's a whole experience. I'm sorry, I cut you off because of the lag. Go ahead. Oh, don't worry. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I, I made a point to read more of the classics. So I was trying to read some 
Dostoevsky, that, that kind of thing. God. Yeah. And then I was like, wow, I should have started earlier to read that kind of thing because it's so deep when you go into it, to the psychology of it all. And it's better than reading philosophy sometimes. Yeah. And, there, and there's a lot of good fiction, old and new, that, that can be very enriching. You know, the, like the message that it gives you uh, as it takes you on a ride through this fictional world. Um, it's, there, there's nothing like it. Whether it's a book or a movie, it doesn't matter. I, think, I, don't, I don't think it matters that much. If you make a good movie, if you make a great movie, I think it can be just as enriching as, um, as, as a book. I mean, a book is more descriptive. You know, it's more of a deep dive. You're in it more, yes. But the movie is, is like, it's sights and sounds too. Like, I don't think I would have been able to experience that, that the, the, the pain of cutting off my own arm if, I hadn't, if it hadn't been for that movie. So it, 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 it's, it's um, I guess the answer lies in balance, right? A healthy balance of both. And, and just fiction in general, man, like comic books. I've, I started reading more because of comic books because it's, it's a shorter read, but the story is just as, as intense. It's like, it's like watching a movie in panels, too. That's what I like about it so much. It's very exciting. Yeah, it's like a, a mini movie. Yeah. And what's your favorite movie? It depends. It really depends. Can I have like a top five yeah, sure. <laughs> because I don't know if there's one favorite movie, right? But I would go with, I would go with uh, The Empire Strikes Back, The Matrix, and you're not going to believe this, but the Lego Movie, the first movie, <laughs> it, it was phenomenal. Um, the Dark Knight, by um, with with um, uh, Chris Nolan, Christopher Nolan. Um, and, uh, you know, for my comic book, for the comic book nerd in me, I'm going to say the first Iron Man movie, too, just because. And, like, there are a couple of movies in the, in the Marvel Universe, but now it's, we're kind of, like, drifting off on the spectrum, right? It, it slides down a little bit, little by little, little by little. Like, the big, big movies that had a big impact on me, I would, I would say, were those. I'm going to throw in Superman, too, just because. Just because. I, I, I realized because I, as an adult, I heard the music again. I, I listened to the track again, and... It just uplifted me so much that I realized, wow, this really had an impact on me when I was little. It must have, right? Because it made me, you know, it gives you the feels. It gave me chills listening to John Williams' original score. Uh, so it, uh, so it has to be those four and Superman. Yeah, so th those would be it. The Matrix, uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Um, what did I say? The um, first Superman Lego movie, movie. Uh, the Lego Movie, and the Batman Movie, the the, the Dark Knight it was just a, such a masterpiece in my in my. Eyes. Oh yeah, that the trilogy is a masterpiece. And All you know what? The Lego movie. Batman Movie is a close second behind that one. <laughs> and it's not, I'm not being ironic. It's not it's not a joke. It's a great. It's a comic. It's a it's a comedy. Uh, it's a spoof of itself and it's beautifully beautifully done it, it it'll make you laugh and cry and, and everything in between it's it's wonder it's a wow. wonderfully written movie the lego batman movie absolutely i never know that the lego movies were good actually no, you 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 are missing out i, I had to watch them because because of my kids but they are so good now i have Just as movies not as kids movies as movies yeah and that's uh, that's quite the compliment to a kid movie to say that yeah, it, I mean, it's it's the life lessons that are, that are in there, and the way that it takes you through uh, that roller coaster ride, and the emotions, and like the all the excitement, and what the characters learn, an adventure well done. Like, yeah, it's it's a it's a whole it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. I was remembering a movie that I watched last year, and it was the Puss in Boots, the latest movie. Oh yeah. Did you watch that? Yes. Oh my God, that that might actually go into like that might slip into my top ten. That the message in that movie is so it it hits hard. He's on his last life. Yeah, like, I, I literally stop, cried. Time, time to and stop it's a kid around. movie. And mm -hmm. yes, yeah, it's, that movie really hit hard. I, I wasn't expecting it to be that good. Yeah, yeah. There are so many good movies, great movies that. You know, there were like it, now. If you want to get into more, more of the like grown-up movies and slightly more recent movies that made me kind of stop and think and like I had to recover from. There was a movie I had to recover from, um, Schindler's List. I had to recover from mm -hmm. that movie. There was a, there was a, I had needed time to sit and recover because it, it hit me so hard. Um, 
uh, and not just movies. Uh, there is a show on, I think it's on HBO Max or Prime Video, I forget which one, called Tales from the Loop. I think it's like eight episodes, all right? Oh, and Pluto is one of, also one of my favorite stories. You said movies, but Pluto's right there. But this show, man, it, like when I got to the end, when I got to the end, I just, I just kind of, it, it, I, I, I was left a sobbing, blubbering mess at the end. I, I, like my, my wife had fallen asleep and, and kind of lost interest, but I, I just got glued to the series. And by the end, I just couldn't stop, I couldn't stop crying. I needed several minutes to, to, to recover and like just to sit in silence before I could even go to sleep because it was, it was so hard hitting. Write it down. Tales from the Loop. It's science fiction. And uh, it's all about life and time and uh, our, t- our time here. It's wild. If I think of something else, I'll, I'll say it. But yeah, th- those are basically like my biggest influences, I would say. You know, the things that make you really think, the stories that really make you think about what we're doing here and how we're doing it and what we should be doing, what's important. What's more? What's what's the most important thing? All those, you know, the big stories that that answer, that not answer, but make you ask those big questions. That's what's important. That's that's kind of what drives me to tell the the best story possible. It's those those questions. You know, it's funny you say this because I'm noticing a trend, especially in movie series, about these existential topics coming up time and time again and Mm -hmm. time traveling and you're time traveling because you want to fix your mistakes and you want Mm -hmm. to fix your mistakes because you weren't loved when you were a child or whatever it is and they're coming over and over again it seems lately yeah there was an episode of tales from the loop where um not necessarily someone was trying to go back I can't, I can't remember I think it was last year that I saw it but there were episodes that made me stop and think well yeah this is just like you know when this happens um, there's an episode where there's this couple who discover this de- a device that can stop time for everyone else except for them because they're wearing the device or something I forget what it was but time stops for everybody except for them for those two and the things that they discover about themselves in those months that go by with everyone just frozen in time while they're doing whatever. Like they, they, you know, they go to the bank, take out money, eat whatever they want, and they you know, have fun and everything. But then at the end, the, what they discover about themselves and, and, and what they're even doing there is, is what really the, the episode is about, right? It's, it starts out with this, this fun little science fiction-y thing, but then it makes you think hard about, wait, this, what's this thing about life? You, you, right there, what's, what are you doing here? Like, whoa, so, whoa, whoa, hey, chill, man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I just want to have fun. I, I don't know. I, I should be doing something better. <laughs> yeah. Those, I think those are the best stories, that, the ones that make you really reflect. Um, and there was another one where um, they find this big sphere, right? And, and um, I don't remember how it was that, that they know this, but they know that... They, uh, um, the number of like if you if you poke your head into it and call out your name or say hello right the number of times that it that the sound echoes back to you is roughly how much time you're gonna how much more time you're gonna live like the more it echoes back to you the more years you're going to live right and this little kid comes in and yeah yeah grandma come here look at this you 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 know you you yell into it and you um and you and the more it echoes the more years you're gonna live and then, uh, and then he's like, you try it. And the grandfather comes in like, hello. And there's no echo. Right? <laughs> and, and the kid's like, kind of just looks at him. He's like, let's go see what your mother's doing. And you're watching this like, oh. And, and, the, and the grandfather was okay with this. And that episode was about, uh, I, think, I think that episode ends with that grandfather dying. But it's, 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 you, know, you, know, you see what I mean, right? The, the end of the, by the end of the series, I was just in, I was a mess. <laughs> But, it, but in a good way, right? It, 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 it really, it's really important to reflect. You can't just live life. You can't just coast or like, you know, coast through life not thinking about things. Just going to your everyday, day-to-day, nine-to-five and whatever. It's these things that everybody always says. But watching a show like that or other stories like that really makes you feel it. You know? Dude, you're 44. Oh, shit. Right? <laughs> 
uh, that, that's the kind of thing that triggered that you, know, you triggered in me when you, when you said you know people who wish they could go back in time. But I don't know. Like I don't think I would go back in time because um, if I were to go back in time and change something, it would probably change my family. Right? I wouldn't have the kids that I have. I, I might I might have a different. I don't know. Like it would be a different. So. I guess like if, if if they if if I was given that choice, I might go back to like to when my second child was conceived. Okay, once that's locked in, all right, make me rich, do whatever, that's fine. But you know, once that's locked in, that's good. But I would not change my family or like having met my the way I met my wife or like or the kids that I have. I would not change any of that. Like to for a chance to go back to the year two thousand and invest in Amazon. Not a chance. I would go back into 2016 and invested Bitcoin, but it wouldn't be as much by then, right? I'd have to go back all the way to 2009 for it to really mean something, but, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it because, because then I wouldn't have my kids. I'd have, I know, I, you know, by 2015, I'd have a lot more money and I'd be doing different things. I'd be doing a different job, different circumstances, different, different nights, you know, different conception. It, it, this all leads to my, the family that I have today, the two kids I have today. I would not change that for literally all the money in the world. Like if I could have that 10,000 Bitcoin, there's a story in Bitcoin in, in Web3 about this guy who used Bitcoin to buy a pizza. And at the time that he bought it, you know the story? Uh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, you know, it was 10,000 Bitcoin because at the time 1,000 Bitcoin was a dollar, was worth, a, uh, cost a dollar. So he spent like 10,000 Bitcoin uh, on $10 to, to, I think he gave it to someone else so that he sold it to the person, to, to a friend who gave him the $10 to buy the, I don't know what it was exactly, how it worked, but the thing is he paid for that pizza with 10,000 Bitcoin. Think for a moment, let's take out a calculator. Like if, if, if you had the chance to, to have that 10,000 Bitcoin, uh, like up until, what is it, a couple weeks ago, my camera just died, I'm sorry. Uh, 10,000 Bitcoin was worth $70,000. That's seven hundred million dollars. Okay, that's seven hundred million dollars. Let me see if I can change cameras. It's gonna be a lower quality camera, but let me let me change it real quickly. It doesn't let me change cameras. I see the camera in the list of, of devices, but I can't I can't click on it. Oh dear. No, we can finish camera less then I guess. Yeah, let me see if I can if I can quickly fix it because I mean it's there. It should I should be able to give me one second and see if I can. If not, then we'll just edit this out and you know we'll end off with like a picture on the screen or something. We'll do we'll do it with a yeah. I can't find it. You can you can put a picture of my uh, of my uh, of my Salvador uh, image. The thing the thing that I've been that I've been working on here. I'll I'll do it now. I'll I'll, I'll take it out now. <laughs> I just finished this today. Uh, it's not shaded yet, but. It's, um, but it's colored in. It's got like the basic colors in and I'm so happy with it. Here, I'll share a screen. Share screen, right screen. Here we go. Here. That's, uh, that's my, my little art piece that I've been working on for several months, uh, bit by bit. <laughs> now it's finally, it's, it's finally there. Like I can, I can finally see him, you know, it's this, that's, that's Salvador. Or at least that's the first, like one of the first um, ideas, iterations, like a rough idea of what of what I'm envisioning for that character. That's that's a little robot who gets treated really poorly and it's gonna gonna give you, all hell's gonna break loose when he when he you know when he lashes out. But uh, that's a little 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 piece of art that I've been working on. You can we we can we can put that on the screen if you want. <laughs> yeah, we, we can leave him. Let's leave Salvador. <laughs> So seven, no, so yeah, I would not trade my kids for seven hundred million dollars. Obviously, <laughs> right? Obviously, um, I, I, I'm willing to stay poor. I, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, but I can go back to 2016 to invest a little bit. Of, I mean, at least a little, you know, <laughs> at least like three x what I have, because I think it was like at one point it was like twenty thousand, and now it's like sixty, fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, I've got, I can three x what I have. You know, I have a little extra, but that's all I'm willing to, to do. Let's see. Oh no, you you would make a lot of money in 2016. It was like 1,500 to 2,000 dollars, depending on the date. Really? 
Well, that's interesting. Yeah, so yeah. I thought it was around the time that it, that it was at like twenty thousand. I think it had gone up to twenty. Oh no, 000 it, this is in high eyes actually. So dollars is about a fifth of that. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's somewhere around there. Well, the thing is, like, even if it's five times, ten times, three times, only twice, it doesn't matter, right? Um, what's what's um, the priority here is is the people that I, that are in my life. That like that's kind of, that's the point of this of this whole uh, of this whole point, right? Uh, to travel back in time only if I can keep the the family that I have now. If not, then no deal. That's beautiful. So you'll have seven hundred yeah, million know, dollars, seven hundred billion dollars. No deal. No deal. You know, because I was going to ask you what you'd tell your eighteen-year-old self, but you probably wouldn't want to change much anyway. So. What would you tell your kids? Oh, it's what like, I tell now them now that they're growing up. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's what I do tell Instead them. Instead of telling your eighteen-year-old self, what kind of things would you tell your kids growing up, so that they can? Instead of giving your eighteen-year-old self that advice, what would you tell your kids instead? I tell them that, you know. Right now, they're they're going through some tough times in school. My oldest is in fifth grade. My youngest is in second grade. And they're both having a hard time right now. Um, what I keep telling my oldest, especially, is that it's not forever. You know, I'm not in math class. I'm not, you know, look at me, I said, right? When, a couple of days ago, I said, look at me. I'm not in fifth grade math, right? No. Yeah, so you know it's not forever. It's, you know, it's going to be okay. Nothing is forever. So that, this bad thing isn't going to be forever either. And I know that it sucks. Uh, I try to hang in there. And I try to help him out with his homework. Um, but he, ha he does have to learn to, you know, be responsible with his homework and with, you know, schoolwork and keeping his notebook up to date and all that stuff. It's regular kid stuff, right? Regular fifth grader stuff. But for the fifth grader, that's, it's hard. It's the hardest thing that he's had to encounter. So it's hard. I just, uh, I just explain those things to them. Uh, like I say, you know, right now it's hard for you. Um, but you're also getting stronger. You're also getting better at the thing. Next year, like last year you were in grade four, right? And that was the hardest thing you'd ever done. And you couldn't imagine having to deal with something that you have to deal with in grade five. And now you're dealing with it. You're surviving. You're still here. You're doing it. And the same thing's going to happen in grade six. And when you're in, if you, you know, go to college and when you get a job and it, it's going to be, it, it, you can't imagine how hard it must be right now. But when you are 18, you're going to think, oh, yeah, you know, grade five uh, math was so easy. And you're going to be able to deal with, it's going to be hard, but you're going to be able to deal with whatever it's, is, you know, in front of you at the time. And, uh, and that's what I kind of keep, I try to give them as much perspective as I can with their, you know, within their you know, limitations of their little minds that they have right now. I try to explain it to them in terms that they can understand just to give them that perspective. Because sometimes, you know, grownups didn't always do that for us. For me, anyway, you know, just to tell them you're going to be okay. Um, I know, I know, school sucks right now, but it's not forever. You're going to be all right. You'll be all right, and, and you'll be stronger next year, and you'll get stronger each each with each passing year, and you'll be better for it. Just hang in there, and I'm here for you. That's another thing. You know, I'll I'll, I'll help you. I'm here with you. I can help you. I can't do it for you, but I can help you, so that you can get stronger and get through it. That's kind of what I try to. It's one of the things that I try to. Um, make them aware of so they, they don't despair you know yeah that's wholesome as well <laughs> yeah awesome life's guy. kind of like a video <laughs> game i think that's a yeah. metaphor that yeah. you can use as well yeah it is yeah i, I do I, I do use that metaphor sometimes um they don't play that many games that are exactly like that but i do but i do use as many metaphors as i can um <clears throat> like i'll use like a harry potter metaphor if i can what, whatever i have on hand that that will be relatable to them and um and accessible to them so that they can understand and and be okay you know tell them all that's my job that's their dad yeah and apparently you're doing a great job at it so congratulations man well thanks well i, I mean i guess I tr i'm trying <laughs> <laughs> doing my best and do you have any big stories coming up apart from salvador of course Anything in the pipeline after that, or I, still focusing on Salvador? Technically, I have three things in the pipeline. There's Salvador, 
there is the um, it's not really in the pipeline, but the uh, the web comic pause and panels is live, right? There are two issues out, and I'm and I'm always working on an issue, and and that's out there. It's out in the world, and I still kind of can't believe it. It's out there, and uh, and this one this book that I wrote with with one of my best friends, um, we are trying to get it finished, but the the big hurdle is the illustrations. The thing is, we wrote a book that could be a novel, but there, it's so visual, it's such an action-packed adventure thing that we wanted to give it um, a comic book feel to it. So we, we decided it was going to be way too long to be a full-blown graphic novel, but it kind of turned into that anyways because it, it's a hybrid between prose and comic panels. So it's like you're reading the story and then suddenly it jumps into comic panels, right? So you know, I, I, took, I took a big breath and I jumped and then suddenly... And suddenly you see the, 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 the panel of the kid jumping and like you're going onto a spaceship or whatever it is, right? And then the next part can be in prose. Like, what are you doing here? Asked so-and-so. So it, it jumps from panels to prose, from panels to prose. And um, it's written, it's done, it's finished. Writing, it's written, I should say, not finished. It's written. Uh, I want to finish editing it. I'm about halfway through editing it. And I do want to translate it because it's in Spanish. We wrote it in Spanish. So I want to get it, I, I want to translate it into English so that I can shop it around and maybe get uh, get it published somehow so that I can get the illustrations done for that. Those are the three big things story-wise that uh, that are kind of in, in like in the in the pipeline. Yeah, we have a lot in the in the plate for for the story nerds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have to find time to sleep sometime uh, somewhere in there. <laughs> somehow. <laughs> maybe it's some naps here or there. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we've touched on this a couple of times during this conversation, but it's something that I always ask. And Gonzalo, what's your definition of success? I guess I would say, well, I, I mean, I think a big part of it I already have, right? Uh, like family, love, good relationships. I, I, think, I think I can check that box. I, I do the laundry whenever I can to, you know, to, to, to be a good husband and father and I try to be good with my kids. I think I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I love my wife madly, deeply, and, and I can't get enough of my kids. So I think I've, I've, I've found success there. That's one part of it. Uh, and also the freedom to have your bills paid and go on vacation at the drop of a hat. I'm still kind of working on that one. <laughs> you know, but, but, but the, the part, I guess the part that's hardest for, for most people to get is, is like to, 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 to build a family a healthy relationship i i think i'm pretty far along uh on on that on that path and then you know just kind of fa finding your your way your path uh professionally which i think i've finally also done or am finally doing you know with with this whole storytelling thing i mean i've been teaching english for t way too many years but but the, like, this establishing myself as kind of a writer and an author and all that stuff, I think it's, um, it's I find kind of find, found myself and now just working on, you know, mo working up the ladder uh, for uh, in, in that area. So I think it's that, you know, it's finding, finding yourself professionally, finding yourself uh, emotionally and in, in relationships and family and love and just free, not, not necessarily to become rich or anything. It's just the, enough freedom to be able to, you know, to have your bills paid, not have to worry about that stuff. And if you want to go and take your kids on vacation, next week just because to be able to do it yeah, um, you beat the game that, that's man. basically it no i'm working on that last part i mean don't don't get me wrong i'm still working on that last part but uh, i think that's that's kind of where i see myself that's the kind of what i'm aiming for to be able to do you know, get my works published and uh, and get paid for this stuff and, and that you know i guess when i get to that peak I'll figure out where I need to go from there. Like, I, like you ask me, ask me again in a couple of years, and, and maybe my answer will change. But for now, I think that's yeah. Uh, by by then, you'll surely like. have achieved it already. Yeah, uh, I hope so. And <laughs> ah, no, definitely, I can see it in six months or so. And where where can people find you? Well, um, I have um, I, there. There's my. There's always my. My uh, my ex like for now like right now it's my ex um, profile. It's at you know Twitter ix dot com Twitter dot com at Gons Pauli, and my um, my little my little Instagram page you know with um, with uh, with the pause and panels comic 
It's literally Instagram.com at uh, slash pause n panels because I couldn't put an ampersand in the in the address bar. <laughs> but it's pause and panels uh, just with an n. And um, and after that, I don't know yet because my you know Salvador still doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a home yet. So it'll be you know just googling you know somebody sees finds this a couple of years from now. You look up Salvador and wherever that wherever that is wherever that's landed. That's that's basically it. But like my 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 main thing is like and my, I have an artist um, profile on Instagram, but it's all in Spanish. So uh, I don't know why I'm mentioning that. I think it's just basically pausing panels in my ex profile. That's where I live most uh, online now these days. Yeah, guys. So make sure to follow Gonzalo on X and pause and panels as well because he is going far in the near future. And hopefully when we listen to this a couple of years from now, we will be able to see all of your web free achievements and think about how the world has changed so far. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Well, see what I want to what I want to accomplish with with the with the X with my X profile is uh, also like teaching other people to 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 tell great stories. You know, because that's the that was the question that I was asking myself a few years ago. You know, a great story is important, but how do you tell a great story? So that's kind of what I'm doing there, um, trying to uh, teach as many people as possible how to do this you know what's important in a story what how do you how do you uh, set up a great um, you know a great cliffhanger how do you create a good character this and that so that's that's what i'm doing over there so maybe you know in a couple of years we like have the have like this great you know story school set up or something i don't know yet i don't know what it is yet but uh it'll be i hope it'll, it'll be something something worth checking out for sure oh yeah i can see that Gonzalo, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Gonzalo Paoli. Thank you so much for coming, man. Well, thank you. Thank you so really much for having it. me for all this time, um, focusing on little on me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was a great, great questions. Great, I had a great time. And uh, it was a great, really great conversation, man. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. And, oh.